guys, how are you? I'm so glad to see you because I have the most huge, awesome surprise. We've never done this on here before and I get to be the one who does it because we have our new book. This month is Shakespeare month and it's Shakespeare month to celebrate the release of our new book. So I'm going to unbox this right now. And um, if you are interested in supporting our channel, uh, come across to our shop. There's our Redbubble shop as well. You can get this book on pre-order. It's coming out on the 1st of July. So we'll just get the get it out of its box. I haven't even seen this yet. Well, I have. I approved it, but you know, I haven't seen it in for real. Ha ha. Oh my. This is. I, I should explain this. Here we go. Oh wow. Oh wow. It's so cool. This is a book for English teachers to teach Shakespeare. It has lesson plans. You can't really see here. That has lesson plans, um, four whole units worth of work. It has everything you need to teach the units. And when you buy it from my website, you get the PDF that you can doubt that has the plays with it. I, it's, it's a chunky enough book. I couldn't, I couldn't put the, the plays in the book itself, but they come as a free download when you buy the book from my website. If you don't buy the book from my website because you're international and this does remember that we sell internationally, there is a code in the front of the book on the page. Um, on the page that says how to use this book and there is a code the the plays are on my website for five dollars but use the code when you've bought the book you get them for free it's the four plays that are included in the book this is so super exciting this is two years worth of of, of work it, it was an idea that I had I thought hey I know I can help take something off the plates of younger newer less experienced teachers especially when you finish um, university it can feel very overwhelming and this is what I created I finally did it um, this is the book I wanted when I finished uni so it's full units of work and they work. How many teachers have had the absolutely galling experience of being given a resource only to find that half the stuff is unusable in your classroom? These come with my experience of being in the classroom over 20 years worth, two decades of experience in the classroom to help make sure these lessons will run. So exciting. This is why we're having a month of Shakespeare. And I am starting out. So I, oh, so good. So good. Um, I am starting out this month. I go to start the month with um, a book by an actor. We are doing, and I will put it here, um, Anthony, Sir Anthony Scher, Anthony Scher's Year of the Fat Knight. I just finished reading it. I finished reading it this morning. Um, and I've, I've seen because, um, because uh, the, of the RSC live recordings, I've actually seen Anthony Scher's Fat Knight. Um, it is in this set which is the king and country. It's the full Henriad, the Richard the third to uh, Richard the second, not third. That's part of the Margaret saga, Richard the second through to Henry the fifth, um, which I think this is still available. So if you, if you want to see Anthony Scher's fat Knight, that's where you can see Anthony Scher's fat Knight. 
Um, I've also seen his Leah. So I could have read his, his, his Year of the Mad King, but um, I don't actually like Leah that much. It's a bit dark and a bit cruel and a bit gloomy. Give me the fat night. Give me the fat night any day. Even, I, I, I mean, I mean, Richard the Third. Now, and, and that's the other one Anthony Shaw is really famous for, but there's no recording of his Richard the Third. It was, he did it on crutches and was like a, describe, the, the performance is described as like being like a demonic arachnid. And that was, I think, his first um, performance diary. So he did that for Richard the Third. I'm assuming Anthony Shaw must have been. Now, Anthony Shaw sadly passed away at the age of 72 in, at the very in December of 2021, which actually I only found out about recently because I don't watch the news a lot. Um, so that's really sad and actually a great loss because he, he was a very, very fine actor, one of the great classical actors. But there's not a lot of recorded um, recordings of his acting because he was a stage actor and stage performances don't get recorded very often. So there, he did very little film. Um, he was in The Hobbit. I'm not sure if his stuff is in the extended cut of The Hobbit. I couldn't stand The Hobbit. I watched all three movies. I got out from the third movie and went, what on earth did I just watch? I like the Lord of the Rings, but I hated the Hobbit. Um, so I can't, I, I can't remember if he was actually in that. He was, he got paid for it. He did scenes. He describes, he actually talks about being in that in the diaries. Now, the diaries are really fascinating because clearly these are written after the year of the fat night after he has been uh full stuff after he has uh performed this so they they are definitely constructed but they have the immediacy of a diary i am assuming that the only way that this could be created to to work as a diary like uh document is antonisha must have been a diarist because there is too much detail, very specific detail that you would not remember over the course of the year. Honestly, I barely remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. No, actually, I do remember what I had for breakfast yesterday because I was working. So I was eating the same thing that I always do when I'm teaching. But you get my drift. I wouldn't remember what I ate on Saturday. And that was like a few days ago. So who I met and who said what to when on which particular day over the course of rehearsing and deciding to do a role. Are you kidding? He must have been a diarist. Also, the fact that he was unsure that he was even going to take on the role of Force Staff means that there's no way he wrote this as it happens, a la minute. So it's clearly a constructed document, but it's a very, very engaging constructed document. And very few diaries that you will read that are published, especially by people who are actually alive, are not censored or constructed in some ways. The immediacy of it is part of the attraction of diary writing, but at the same time, it's just like any kind of writing. It is a construct and not exactly what, um, what it fully appears to be, even though it's not fiction. Um, I did find that I had a much more appreciation of the role of his performance as Falstaff in this. Um, I, I, I'm not going to say he's my favourite Falstaff because that would be very, very much lying. Um, because this performance, this one from the Globe, which I believe was occurring at March the same time, may have been a little bit earlier, the Globe performance with Roger Allen. Roger Allen is my favourite fall stuff. Uh, Roger Allen is a, a big, boisterous, funny, 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 funny fall stuff. Um, 
Anthony Sher did not want to take it the comedic route for Falstaff. And to a certain degree, there was a level of influence from the Hollow Crown series that um, with Simon Russell Beale's Falstaff, who I swear is my least favorite Falstaff because he's nasty. I did not like that Falstaff. In fact, I watched the Hollow Crown Henriad and I thought, or, or the, the Henry, the, the fourth parts one and two, and I thought, there's a funnier play under this. There is a much, much funnier play underneath all this grime. Scrape the grime off, scrape the nastiness off, and there is a really funny play. And that was how I came across the Globe one. I thought, okay, well, let's see what they do here. It's a funny play, which is part of, I think, what makes the history plays really interesting. And why am I talking about Henry IV, apart from the fact that I don't particularly like Lear? One of the plays in here is Henry IV, part one. There's an entire unit on it. You can do. That's why, that's why there's Howl and Fall stuff in the, on the cover. They're actually in the play. The, 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 four, the three plays are Henry IV, part one, uh, Julius Caesar, and The Taming of the Shrew. And down here we have the upstart crow himself. So that's why I wanted to look at his uh, Henry IV diary. I would have actually probably liked to read his uh, Richard III, and I probably will, but the State Library had the Henry IV as an e-book, so I went with that. I, it was, that was coincidence. Kismet, kismet. But uh, anyway, reading his diary sort of helped me understand the choices that were made in the RSC collection. I won't say of the three Falstaffs that I've seen that Anthony Sher is my favorite false, uh, second favorite Falstaff because I haven't yet seen, and this is really important, Orson Welles. I have to watch Orson Welles. I have a distinct feeling he's going to be second favorite Falstaff, which would make Anthony Sher third favorite Falstaff. But reading the diaries, it's very easy to understand why he took the choices he did and the kind of false stuff he wanted to create. He wanted to create a more human false stuff. When you take false stuff big and broad and funny, he is almost an embodiment of an England that the English like to believe that they have, this pastoral, um, boisterous, exuberant false stuff is is to them England. This is England in all its best qualities for them. Um, he he is an irrepressible force. Any any performance he is an irrepressible force, but especially when he's played comedically, he is an irrepressible force. He is almost like the spirit of the country. And it is interesting if you view it like that the spirit of the country, you can't kill it. Duncan, um, yeah, it's Duncan um, fights with Falstaff and Falstaff plays possum to avoid him and then jumps back up famously, which is one, it, which is so ludicrously, stupidly funny that it makes sense to make him funny. He also has some of the wittiest lines, which is part of the reason why I like the history plays. The history plays are... Most people, when they approach Shakespeare, they start with the big tragedies. You know, you start with Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth, Hamlet. Um, I'm not in a theatre, so I can say the M word. Uh, or, or they, or they tend towards the comedies, the easy, light things like A Midsummer's Night Dream, uh, Much Do About Nothing. Sometimes Taming of the Shrew, though Taming of the Shrew is a little bit of a difficult play to get a handle on. But a lot of the comedies a lot of the tragedies. The history plays are something that a sort of, you have to really know your Shakespeare to start getting into the history plays. Um, I got into the history plays because one of the first ones I saw was Kenneth Branagh's Henry V. And I'd always been curious about the Henry IV plays because he puts little bits with Falstaff, Robbie Coltrane, 
Now that that's really a fascinating concept. Robbie Coltrane is full stuff. Uh, a full Robbie Coltrane is full stuff. Like, wow, that could be interest. That could have been an interesting. That's like one of the great what could have beens. But he put that in there, and I didn't realize that that came from a different place. So as a as a twelve year old. Looking for these, where is, where is this fat knight? Where, where is this? It's not in the play. Where is this coming from? So when I, I actually finally saw Henry the Fourth, it's like, oh, wow. This is, this is brilliant. The history plays are, they're sort of, they are their own beast. They, they, they can incorporate comedy. They can incorporate pastoral. They can incorporate great tragedy. They can incorporate great heroics. They're, they've got a lot of stuff in them. On one hand, Shakespeare talks about succession. On the other hand, he's talking about honor and different sorts of, 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 uh, intrigues and also a group of Thieves, which is what Falstaff is part of. There are so many different things, different elements of it. There's the political side. There's the personal side. It's what I think makes it such a interesting play to look at. And so Antonisha is able to give his reasoning behind why he creates a darker Falstaff than some of the others. It's not... It's, it's how he's interpreting that text, how he's looking for those clues as to creating a full stuff that he can play. Not a full stuff that somebody else can play, but his interpretation of full stuff, which is, of course, the beauty of Shakespeare and theatre is there is no definitive. You never have a definitive. It's, it's so free from that constraint of film. A remake of a film is, is, going to be somewhat derivative of that fi of the film that went before it um a and and it's either going to be a genuinely up remake or it's going to just drag it down but a play is a constantly renewed beast one performance doesn't cancel out the others which is is what makes this it so fascinating to look at different performances but in terms of just being able to spend a year with this very engaging, very interesting, thoughtful man who painted, wrote, performed, Anthony Scher's Year of the Fat Knight is absolutely well worth having a look at, especially if you like performance, um, if you like Shakespeare, but if, if you're really interested in performance and what it takes to perform this stuff, that's another really interesting element to it. Not to mention the fact that he's married to the director, which gives another layer of interest to that, um, that relationship and that performance and how that comes about. Um, so anyway, we will, we will have another Shakespeare themed film for you next week um and until then peace peace love i'll see you again don't forget to check out our website i'll see you later bye if you would like to support this channel come across to the black cocky press website www.blackcockypress.com.au where you will find books and other writing services to help with your writing.